We have been studying in 1 Corinthians recently, and one of the verses that we had studied, one of the things that we had looked at was in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and, and Paul was talking about an immoral man that was in the congregation, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 he had said, When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of the Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed, but his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. And I was thinking about that, and we talked about it in the uh, Wednesday night uh, study, but the idea of being handed over to Satan, and I realized that in one way or another, that's what God did with us when mankind sinned in the Garden of Eden. And he basically said, well, if you want to follow Satan, if you want to follow that old serpent, the devil, and and you want to go that route, then now we know Satan as the god of this world. We know him as the uh, prince of the air. We know him as, as the one that has that rule. And, and Satan was able to come in during the fall and he had uh, powers that he basically had, powers that he took in a way, and that was in death, hell, and the grave. And we know that he comes to kill, steal, and to destroy, that those are the things that he likes to do, and that... That power was there of death, hell, and the grave, and there was that fear that came on mankind, that fear of dying, that fear of destruction, that fear of death, the fear of the grave, and, and we know that Satan rules with the power of fear. That's one of his great weapons is that of fear. But then Jesus came, and, and Satan thought that the power he had was greater than God, forgetting that he was a created being with his pride and with his arrogance. He thought, well, I'll use these powers I'll have. I'll... I'll kill the Savior, Savior, I'll put him in the grave, and I'll, I'll hold him in hell, and he won't have any chance because that's my great power. That's where I really can, can do something. Those are my, that's my dominion, really. But then Jesus came out and, and conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. And, and even though he put him to death, he rose again from the dead, and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father even today because he took that power away, and now we no longer have to fear we no longer have to live in that dread because that power was, was taken away. But there is that, that warfare that we have to face. There is that, that um, battle that still has to be fought uh, against the devil and, and his ways. There's, there's two areas of Scripture I'd like to look at that talk about the warfare. The first one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you can turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to diminishing strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And then the other verse of Scripture I want to look at, and one that I'm sure we're all very familiar with, is in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. Speaking of the full armor of God, and I know there's been many sermons preached on this, and there's been many teachings taught on this. As a matter of fact, uh, one man uh, wrote a book called The Complete Armor of God, and I think it's around 1,200 pages just on this section of Scripture. And it, it's really good, too, but it's also rather long. But there, there's a lot that we can, we can get from this. And as a matter of fact, I, I even preached on this, uh, I think, a couple years ago. But uh, it says in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. And here it talks about that fight that we have, that it's not against flesh and blood, that it's not against uh, people of this world, but it's against those principalities, against those powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. And I don't know at what time Satan established his 
hierarchy in his system in which he would have his different uh, levels of rulership and leadership in his kingdom, but we know that God has had that. He has archangels, he has covering cherubs, he has the different offices that are in heaven and probably Satan fashioned it after that. And we see most clearly that being brought into a, uh, into a system, a religious system uh, at the Tower of Babel, and we don't get a lot from our Bible about what happened there, but if we look at history, ancient history, reading about the Babylonian religion and the secret religions that came out of that, we see that that was a time that it was really institutionalized. That was a time that, that Satan took his, his powers and was able to establish a religion, even secret religions and, and those types of things. And that's where that came about. And so we have these forces that we have to battle with. We have these uh, dominions that we have to come against. And it's not a fleshly battle that we fight, but it's one against the rulers of darkness of this age. And let's go to the Lord in prayer right now and I would encourage you to pray for me because when we start looking at what the devil is trying to do, when we start preaching about the attacks he's trying to do and we start making a stand against it, then he likes to come out and attack strongly. If you're, if you're firmly in his kingdom and you're firmly serving him, he has no reason to attack you. But in a place where God's trying to move, that's where he attacks. And I know he's tried to attack this last week. He's tried to attack me in different areas because he doesn't want this message to go out. And so as I go to the Lord in prayer, I just encourage you to, to lift me up that the word will flow out and what God wants to do will be said. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, that your power is greater than any powers of this world, that there may be many gods that claim to be gods, but Lord, there is only one true God, and that is you. And Lord, I just pray that in this place, even right now tonight, that you will be the God, that your dominion will be here in such clarity and in such authority that any attacks of the devil, that any hindrances to the message that want to go out, that any distractions that he may try to bring, that Lord, you will just put them all to a stop before they can even begin, that, that your word, your covering, your spirit will be here in such power that, Lord, we'll be able to receive the message that you have in Jesus' name. Amen. And what I want to look at as we look at the attacks of the devil and the way he moves is I want to look in Genesis and see how he did it in the first time that he came and he, and he moved. When he, when he first made man fall, when he deceived man, he didn't make him fall, but he deceived him into it. And in Genesis chapter 3, we can find the story. And I think we can see here some clear ways that, that Satan wants to attack, some clear... Uh, devices that he likes to use and, and modes that he likes to use. It says in the Bible that we are not ignorant of his devices and so we need to know what they are and so that we can see them, so that we can see what he's trying to do in this place. We know some of the areas that God's trying to move in this church was in air areas of worship and in praise and we see even now, look at how many we have on the praise team right now, whereas weeks ago we would have had so much more. One of the areas that Satan's attacking, one of the areas where he's winning a victory, and other areas with the kids and reaching out to him, and, and look at how the leaders have left downstairs that were working with kids and how shorthanded we are down there. Another area where Satan's getting a victory. But see, it doesn't matter how many battles he gets a victory over there. I know who's going to win the war, and that's Jesus Christ. And it may not matter when little skirmishes come and he gets a little victory and a little victory there. It doesn't matter because if we're steadfast and sure, Jesus is going to give us the ultimate victory. And we're going to see God move in this place in such a powerful way like we never have before. And first there has to be that cleaning time. First there has to be that cleansing time, that preparation time, that making straight for the way of the Lord. And we're going to see God's power move in this place like never before. And I'm thankful for the attacks that have been coming on this place. I'm thankful for, for the things that are happening because... That shows me that God does want to move. That shows me that God is doing something here. Because if he was not, then Satan wouldn't be attacking. Satan wouldn't be coming in and trying to destroy all these things that God wants to do. And because of those attacks even, it's an opportunity for us to rejoice. And so, as we look in Genesis chapter 3, we see in verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say to you, you must not eat of any tree in the garden? 
And the first thing I want to see here is that he went to the woman first. He didn't go to the one that had been given dominion over the earth. He didn't go to the one that had been given the command, but instead he went out of the proper chain of things. He went out of order. And one of the things that Satan wants to do in a church is to have things be done out of order, to go in a way that is not proper. I've, I know one, one pastor that I've uh, had a chance to share with a little bit recently. He was in a church, and, and he had a member in the church, uh, a family in the church that didn't like what he was doing. But instead of going to him and talking to him about it and trying to get it straightened out, they went over his head to the district and started causing trouble for him at the district level. That's the kind of thing Satan wants to do. He wants to go out of order. He wants to move in a way that is not proper. And in, in our relationship with the God and in the church, there's proper ways to do things. There's proper people to go to, even with the interim pastor. If you have problems with things I'm doing, you come to me and you talk to me about it. And we, we settle it. And then if we can't come to an agreement, then you go to the district level. You don't go call up the district officials first and start there. And so... There is that proper order of thing, and the first thing he did is he knew that Adam knew exactly what, what God had said. He knew that Adam was the one that had dominion, but he thought if he could get in to his helpmate, if he could get in to the one that was, that was working with him, then he could cause that fall, and he often does that today. He doesn't, he doesn't always attack the leaders that are at the platform first. He doesn't always start up there, but he'll start down in the congregation and start bringing discord, he'll start bringing confusion, he'll start bringing arguments and bitterness and all these different things and then that flows up to the podium and the, the spirit of the church will affect the leaders in the church and then, then they'll see them to start the fall and that's what happened here because he was able to deceive woman then man and likewise just followed right after her and did the same thing. And then we see that he says to her, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Another one of his tactics right here is he likes to twist the Word of God. He likes to change what God is saying. He likes to make it sound like God means one thing when He means another. And He'll come in and He'll try to twist the Word of God and He'll, he'll twist it in ways that sound good. You can sit down with some of the different cults and I know the Jehovah Witnesses are real good like this. They're able to put together real good arguments by taking Scripture out of context. And if they can follow their flow of the way they want to go, it sounds right because they're able to pull the Scripture out of context and put this argument together. And that's why they're able to deceive people and bring them in. And they twist the Word of God by taking it out. And one of the reasons that verse that we read earlier about casting down imaginations in 1 Corinthians or I mean in 2 Corinthians, the one that said the weapons that we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power. Demonishing strongholds, we diminish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You see, one of the areas that Satan wants to attack us in, one of the areas that he wants to get victory in our lives is in our thought life, in, in our attitudes, in that area where we don't understand what the scripture says or we change what the scripture says and we need to live our life wholly to the scripture you know some of the things like uh, be faithful in the small things and God will bless you in the big things like we talked about this morning there are people they want to they want to be leaders on the high up level they want to be way up here but they've never come and they've never submitted themselves and been down on the lower level I know I saw that even in, even in uh, school, when I went there, there's people, they, they immediately, when they get out of school, they want to go and they want to pastor a big church and they want to, you know, have a big salary and they want to see these great things happen. And when I tell them, well, what are you going to do? And I say, well, I'm going to go to a local church. I'm going to submit myself to a pastor. I want to sit under his leadership. I want to learn from him for a few years before I go out. It's a foreign concept to them. They don't understand that. They don't, they don't realize what it is. But see, that's part of doing what the Bible says and we can twist it in our own minds and make it make it come out to where we want to and that's why one of the weapons we have is that casting down of arguments of imaginations of, of bringing our thought life into captivity with God and that may even bring up the question well does that mean that Satan can put thoughts in our minds or he can he can come into our minds and put things there that he wants to No, he can't do that he, if he could he wouldn't have talked to Eve. He would have just planted that in her mind. He would have said, there, 
put it in our mind, but I don't believe that Satan can come and put stuff in our minds, but he does in our spirit try to lead us certain ways and he tries to, to bring things in and he can even do that in relationships with individuals and we'll, we'll see that in just a moment. But, but he'll try, try to get us to just not quite follow Scripture the way it's really written, not quite do what we are supposed to do. And even, even in the, some of the things that God's been doing in this place and talking about how we should visit the shut-ins, how we have that work to do, he'll say, well, yeah, that's what the Scripture says, but that means that so-and-so needs to go there, not you. That means that such-and-such such needs to do this, not you. And, and just kind of that little bit of twist, it doesn't have to be much. It doesn't have to be off by very much, but if he can get us off just a little bit from what the God's saying, what the Spirit's saying, what the Bible's saying, he can win a victory in our lives. And so we have to beware of him doing that. And then, of course, we know what happens. The woman uh, sees in her heart that the... Um, food is good to eat, that it's pleasing to the eye, those lusts, those things that, that we talk about, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, lead her to, to partake of the tree, the man eats with her, and then God comes and he starts to ask what's happening, and he says in verse 10, uh, Adam answers him, he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid, and he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat? And man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. And you know, in this time that he's hiding from God and then immediately after this when he finds out what the serpent did, you see God cursing the serpent and you, you see the different things that he says to woman and he says to man. And it seems like the serpent's still kind of hanging out close by with Adam and Eve. He still seems to be in the same general facility and I don't believe that some of the things that happened here such as man trying to hide from God that may have even been Satan there trying to tell him okay now you need to hide from God one of the things that Satan wants to do is he wants to get us away from our relationship with God and he has many ways that he can do that we talked about that uh, last week I think it was where we said that sometimes people will jump around to the church where the hottest things going where the fastest things going because that's one of the ways that Satan can keep you from your relationship with God one of the things that we have to be able to do one of the reasons that some people do like a small church and other people's don't is because of that accountability you have in a small church people know when you're not there people see when you're when you're dragging your feet and you're not worshiping God like you used to and they're able to reach out to you and if Satan can get you in a big church where you just kind of blend in and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with big churches but this is one of the things he can do get you in this big church where you blend in and you don't do anything and people don't notice when you're not there that's one of the devices that he uses trying to to get you away from God to kind of hide from God and and just be, be kind of in the forest so to speak hiding back there and that's one of the things that he will do and then we see what Adam's response was he says the woman you put here with me she gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it and one of the things that Satan wants to do is he wants to hurt relationships between each other. And he'll do that in this place. It may start with a small comment and then you think, oh, why did so-and-so say that? They must not like me anymore. They must be mad at me. And then all of a sudden another thing and another thing. And, and it starts to add up. And all of a sudden in our mind, that imagination again, that thought life again, all of a sudden it gets to a point where we think, oh, this person just, just is just terrible. They're not even a Christian. What's the matter with them? And, and the other person's thinking the same thing about us, whereas if we would just talk, if we would keep that close communication with, with, with each other, if we keep that closeness, we wouldn't give that opportunity for Satan to attack. And I think we've all seen that in our lives where he's attacked in these areas of relationships with each other. It could even happen with a husband and wife where, you know, she's thinking... Uh, well, that dirty so-and-so, why doesn't he, you know? And he's thinking, well, that nasty little girl, why doesn't she? And yet, if they got together and talked about it, they would find out that they were in agreement in this area. And so often, Satan will try to do that in the church. And the thing we have to do is be ready and watching for that. And immediately, when something starts to come up and that friction starts to come up and that separation between individuals and the church starts to come up and take care of it and deal with it instantly and take care of it and not give him that opportunity to come in and cause that division. And here we see that, that man had had that happen to him and that, that he had get, gotten that division. And uh, I'd hate to have been uh, in that cave or wherever they were that day when she said, 
the woman you gave well what are you talking about the woman you gave me where blaming it on me you didn't have to eat it you know uh, I'm sure that that didn't cause for um, fruitful conversation afterwards the way that he did that uh, accusing her and talking about her in such a way like boy what did you give me her and of course it didn't help his relationship with God accusing her and oftentimes that's another way that Satan will work in a church he'll try to get us to say well it's all them God I don't why should I forgive them? Why should I go to them? They're the ones that are wrong. They're the, they're the ones that did it. They're the ones that aren't listening to you. They're the ones that are doing wrong. And, and we can constantly have that too is another way that Satan can come in. Another way that Satan can get that foothold where we always have this attitude that it's always somebody else that's wrong and it's not ourselves. And instead of saying, well, it doesn't matter who's wrong. We need to take care of this. We need to deal with this. We need to not let Satan get this stronghold and be the one to step forward and to, to make that that uh, move to, to try to deal with what he is doing. And that's why some of the weapons that we have are not carnal. Some of the weapons that we have, all of the weapons that we have, are mighty through God to the pulling down of these strongholds. They're, they're weapons that we have to understand we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. And when these things start to happen and these frictions start to happen, we're not fighting against brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. We're fighting with principalities and powers that are trying to come in and destroy the work that God's doing. They're trying to come in and destroy the church. And in this place, we've seen the attacks very strong lately. And, and I believe it's because God is planning to move in this place in a powerful way and even is moving at this time. And, and that's why we've seen these attacks. And that's why we have to be ready with the weapons that we have. That's why we have to understand that we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting each other. We're all children of God if we know Jesus Christ and we all have that same goal. And we need to be willing to work together, have that unity, have that, have that single-mindedness of purpose like in the upper room when they were all in one accord and the Holy Spirit fell. Have that, have that one accord thought and prayer and, and devotion to Him and then we can see the Spirit God fall. One of the things that the Bible says is that if we submit ourselves unto God, then if we re resist the devil, he will flee from us. Submit to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. And sometimes we try to resist the devil, but we haven't done that submission first. And that's the first step that we have to make in that walk that we have. And then we see some of the results of what happened after the fall. We see Cain and we see Abel in chapter 4. Adam lay, chapter 4, verse 1, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil and offered to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And here the next thing we see is that Cain and Abel were both in a position in which they had some form of religion. They both were making sacrifices to God. They both understood, apparently, Adam and Eve had passed down the understanding of a sacrifice. Uh, they saw God when they were thrown out of the gar garden. God slew an animal and gave them the animal skins to cover them. And, and somewhere, somehow, they understood the idea of sacrifice and they they pass that on to Cain and Abel, and here we see Cain and Abel are religious people. Cain and Abel are wanting to worship God, they're wanting to serve God, but you see Cain didn't make a sacrifice that was acceptable for God, and how do we know whether the sacrifice was acceptable or not? Normally in the Old Testament what we see is when God accepts a sacrifice, fire would come down and consume the sacrifice. And so in some way, Cain realized that God did not accept his sacrifice, but he accepted Abel's. Abel gave him the sacrifice of the firstborn of his flock, the fat portions, the type of sacrifice that God was pleased with. But then when, 
When Cain's sacrifice wasn't accepted, Cain became angry with anger with with Abel, and his face was downcast. and And we'll see that sometimes in churches and religious systems, if if one is doing things for God and God's blessing them, sometimes they'll get angry with them and they'll they'll think, well, why is God moving in that area and try to kill what they're doing, just like Cain killed Abel. They'll try to attack what's happening. We can see that even happening right now today with many of the revivals that are going on today. There's churches that aren't having revival and what do they do? They go and attack what's happening in that other place. There's people that, that find out everything that's wrong with the revival, but they don't tell you what's, what's right. They don't tell you uh, how to have your own revival. They don't have a revival where they're at, but they're so easy to pick and to tear down and to try to bring that death, try to bring that destruction when God always comes and brings life. And so the religious people here we see in Cain and that religion that he had that was not pleasing to God. And God said, if you do what's right, I'm going to accept you. Just do what's right. And instead of attacking someone else when they're getting blessed, if we're not, we should look in our lives and say, God, if I'm doing something wrong, show me so I can do it right. And instead of getting angry, instead of getting frustrated, instead of trying to get all downcast and attacking what's happening in a different place, it's one of those ways that Satan can come in and get a power over us, where Satan can come in and, and cause that, that victory for himself by, by coming with religion and setting up a religious system that's not pleasing to God, and then in that religion system, turning our backs on the one that is accepted by God and, and uh, trying to destroy it, trying to cast it down, trying to, to do things that are not pleasing. And of course, the final outcome of, of it is in verse 8, now Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And there we see that's one of the ultimate things that Satan wants to do is he wants to have brother fighting against brother. He wants to bring death. And especially in a church, he wants to have people fighting with each other, bringing death to each other, bringing destruction with, with, um, with gossip, with attacks, with backbiting, with, with bickering, with all these different things. He wants to come. And he wants to bring a death. He wants to bring a destruction there. He, he loves for the brother to fight against brother. And then when he can do that, and we have a religious system that's set up, and today we see so much of it. There's so much religion in our world today. There's so many people that have their own ways of serving God, and they attack what's right with God. And once he does that, he sets up a system in which it gets worse and worse. And we see here in verse 23, it says, Lamech and his said to his wives, Ada and uh, Zila, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for my wounding me and a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech seventy-seven times. And here we see a descendant of Cain rejoicing in the evil that he's doing, saying, well, if Cain had this curse on him for seven times, uh, that someone would touch him would be cursed uh, seven times, then for me it's 77 times because I'm so much more wicked for, than Cain. And we have this in the world today. What happens is when we have brother fighting against brother, we have these false religions that get set up and then it passes down through the generations and it gets worse and worse to the point where people think that it's something to rejoice about. They think that their wickedness is something to celebrate. And we can see that today. I saw a bumper uh, sticker the other day. It said, I heart eternal damnation. I love eternal damnation. It said, keep rock and roll evil. They had three bumper stickers on this car. Those are the two I remember. And, uh, and they start to rejoice in this. They start to think, they say things like, boy, I don't want to go to heaven because all my friends are going to be in hell and I want to go down there and I want to party with them in hell. I mean, at least we'll all be together and we'll all have a good time. And they, it comes to a point, and that's one of the ways that Satan attacks those that are outside of the church, is he gets them to a point where they rejoice in their sin, where they rejoice in their separation from God, and he gets them to a point where they think that this is great, this is wonderful, this is where they want to be. And that's where it's so important for us to reach out to them and to, to show them the Word of God, to show them the truth, to use those weapons of our warfare. And one of the things that Ephesians talks about is to have that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that, that Word that's living and active and able to penetrate even to the soul and the Spirit, dividing them up, even the joint and the marrow, something that you can't even separate. And so 
I just want to encourage you this evening. I know it's starting to get late. I want to encourage you to be ready for the attacks of the devil as he comes here. He's attacked in this place so much. We, we have now our Royal Ranger le leader resigned this morning. We don't have anybody to teach the kids downstairs. It's almost to the point where we'd have to tell them, don't even come anymore, kids, because we don't have anything for you. But that's what Satan wants to do. That's the victory he wants to have. And instead, we'll do some restructuring down there and we'll have it kind of like a, uh, a Sunday uh, service that we would have for the kids, like a Sunday um, a worship service, like a children's church type of thing. We'll do it that way. We'll be able to have the Royal Ranger missionettes as, as such, but we can still do something for the kids and bringing them in. Because see, Satan doesn't want those kids to learn about Jesus. Satan doesn't want those kids to grow up serving Him. He, he wants them to stay in His kingdom. He has some of their parents and He wants to keep them as well. And He doesn't like it when God starts to move in to His territory. We used to sing that song, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. It's time for us to get on the offensive. It's time for us to start standing up against the attacks that Satan's doing in this place and say, I don't care how much he wants to attack the worship that's going to be going on in this church. I don't care how much he wants to try to take away those that are leading in the worship and the worship team and try to destroy it. I am going to do what God wants to do and we are going to move forward in worship in this place. I don't care how much he tries to attack what's happening with the kids downstairs. We are going to serve these kids. We are going to reach out to them. We are going to have something for them. And it doesn't matter what attacks he brings. It doesn't matter if, we, if Kate has to go down and teach those kids, even though she's 80 years old, she'll go down there and do it because we're going to make that stand for God. Sorry, Kate, didn't mean to put you on the spot there. But we need to make that commitment. I knew you'd be generous and gracious if I did that, though. Um, we need to make that commitment to say no matter where he attacks, we're going to stand up. And the more he attacks, the more we're going to pray. And the, the more he attacks, the more we're going to commit to God and, and see him move. And we know that God is going to pour out his spirit in a mighty way. We know that God wants to do something here. And, and so I'd encourage you, and the fact that, God, that Satan has attacked in so many areas here recently, I would encourage you to know that God is planning on using this place to reach out into this community, especially with the children, to reach out to them and to bring them in and see many of them coming to the Lord and, and turning their lives and seeing that reach out to their parents and, and seeing them come in. And we're going to see people from this community coming into this church because that's what God wants to do. And I believe that that's why Satan has been attacking because he has a stronghold in this community. He has, a, he has a dominion in this community and he doesn't want us to move in on what he has. And so I encourage you to, to be steadfast in prayer, to be committed to prayer, to, to, to take that time, extra time, and commit it to the Lord and just make that commitment to him that, Lord, in whatever way I can help God, let me help. Whatever way I can, whatever abilities I have, like we talked about this morning, even if it's in some small ways, Lord, just show me where I can be used. And Lord, I will do it, and I believe we will see a great victory in this place as we stand up against the devil, as we stand up against his attacks, and we say, no, no more, devil, we're not going to let it happen. We're going to march into the enemy camps. We're going to march into this community. We're going to march into this area that you have a stronghold. And because of these attacks you've had on us, we're just going to, that's just getting us angry. And we're just going to go out there and we're going to take even more kids for Christ. We're going to, we're going to bring more of them into the church instead of less. We're going, to, we're going to have a more powerful worship service instead of less. Because remember that Satan was, was created with the pipes in him. Music is one of his greatest areas. That's why rock and roll is so demonic and so, so oppressive. And we see so much death and destruction that comes from it. Because that's where Satan has his, has his greatest uh, area, his greatest abilities is in that of worship, in that of music. And that's why he hates it when a church starts to move forward in that area. And as we stood up and made a commitment to that, he's attacked in that area. He's won some victories. He's won some small battles. But we're going to make that commitment even here tonight that God's going to win the war, that we're not giving up on what God wants to do in that area, that we're moving forward. And even though it may look small now, even though it may not look like much now, God's going to do a great thing and this place is going to be a firehouse for Him as we stand up and be obedient to the Word of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank You, Lord, for...
your love for the work that you're doing in this place. I thank you, Lord, for how much you have done even already in all the areas that you are moving in. And I just pray, Lord, that we will be open, that, Lord, our eyes will see spiritually what you are doing in this place, that we will hear, Lord, from your spirit what we are doing, that what you are doing in this place, that, Lord, we will not get distracted by things that do not look like they're going the way they should or, or by things that, that look like uh, the devil's winning in some areas, but Lord, instead we will make a commitment to you that we will be uh, spend that time in prayer and even in fasting, Lord, if you lead us into that area, that Lord, we will make a commitment that we will see what you are doing, that we will praise you and worship you for the things that you are doing. And Lord, we know that you are getting ready to pour out Your Spirit here in a way like it's never been done before. Help us, Lord, to be prepared as You come in power and in strength. Help us, Lord, to be in place, Lord, to have the things moving in the direction that You want them to be moving so that, Lord, as You come down and Your glory fills the temple once again, that we will be ready for what You want to do, that we will have a strong place for You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Marissa, if you'd come to the piano and play. And I just want to encourage you now, if you want to spend some time in prayer at the altars, that the altars will be opened up for you. And, and pray about it and see if, if God may even have you to fast and pray these, these coming weeks sometime. Maybe, maybe it's not uh, all week, maybe it's not all day, but maybe for some meals or maybe one day at a time or, or however He may lead you. But I would encourage you to pray in that area. Uh, I wasn't planning on saying anything about fasting, but... Uh, it seemed as I was praying to the Lord that, that He just kind of laid that on my heart that, that He may want some of us to do that in some areas. And so I'd encourage you to just be sensitive if the Spirit's leading you in that way to, to just let Him do that. I want to encourage you to come to the altar. Uh, if you want to spend some time in prayer as Marissa plays on the piano to just, to just say, God, how can I fight the good fight? How can I be in this battle, Lord? How do you want to use me? Uh, when we go to war, all the soldiers have different things that they do. They have foot soldiers, they have cavalry, they have tanks, they have uh, airplane pilots, they have all these different things. Uh, those that are out on the ships, so many different ways that, that soldiers can be used in an army. And in the same way, the army of God that we are in, we all have different areas that we can work, different areas where God may call us to strengthen. We may be a prayer warrior, we may be one that's just full of the Word and burns bright with the Word to go out into the community or to share with the kids. There's so many ways that we can be used. And so I just encourage you to spend some time in prayer and see where God wants to use you. It may not even be in the same way you've been used in the past. And you may, you may even be sitting there thinking, well, God really doesn't have anything special He wants me to do. Remember the sermon this morning. Everything we do for Him is special. And He may want you to do some things that you didn't realize He wanted you to do. And if you just pray, spend that time asking Him. I believe He will reveal that to you, what He wants to do in this place. And so let us go to the altars now in prayer. And if you feel released by the Spirit, then uh, you are free to go.